finally speak to the um, some some calls to action, some ways in which you can be involved um, and support this work and support families that find themselves in this really horrible position. Uh, and at the very end, we are going to have some time for Q&A. So what I'm going to ask you all is as you have questions over the course of this event, you can type those in the chat. We do have someone monitoring that and we'll try to lift up as many of those questions as we can. I know there are a lot of questions on this subject, so we will get to as many as we can. Uh, and Inez Bordeaux, who's with us, will, will sort of facilitate a Q&A at the end of this call. So that's our agenda for today and the, the sort of run of show. Um, I just wanna say to get us started that the past year, this subject has been um, a very prominent one for obvious reasons. The, the nation was really gripped by the murder of George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor and others. And this prompted Arch City to start this series that you see here, which we call Justice for Them All, really lifting up the, the human stories of who these people were, who were killed mostly by police in these particular instances, or sometimes private security, sometimes neighborhood watch. We've seen many different manifestations of it. And we know that this has been a, a particularly prominent issue in the St. Louis region for a number of reasons. One is that the St. Louis Metro Police Department has the highest average rate of killings per population of any major police department in the country, a really shocking and um, striking statistic. We also have consistently one of the highest numbers of um, police officers per capita in this region. And we've of course seen some um, very notable uprisings after police killings, most notably in 2014, August 9th, 2014, when Michael Brown was killed by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. Um, but time and time again since then, including this past summer, we've seen uprisings locally. Uh, and so we know that this is an issue that has impacted far too many families in St. Louis and that many people have been engaged around and really um, inspired to take action in, in response to. And so we're launching this project, this Fatal State Violence Project, as a way of really deepening our own work and own understanding of this problem. And we really wanna invite you into that today. So that's really uh, everything from me. I am going to hand it off to our Skadden Fellow and Staff Attorney, Emmanuel Powell, who is one of the people that's been really leading on this work, um, even though he just joined us this, this past fall, really been leading on it for, for a few years now. And I will let him share more about that work. Great, thank you so much, Blake. Um, I'm really excited to start our uh, discussion of research findings with stories from surviving families. Um, this project really starts back in 2017. That was the year that my cousin Ronnie Shorter was killed by police back home in Mississippi. It was also the year that I came to Arch City as an intern and uh, within the first few weeks of my internship was introduced to the family of Isaiah Hammett. Isaiah was killed um, at 21 years old uh, in the summer of 2017 and our, through our interactions with the family I um, started to see that there were a lot of um, issues that I saw in my own family. Uh, and as we started to have conversations with families, including Isaiah's, but also the families that you see on the screen, uh, the family of Tyler Gephardt, Lewis Lynn Payton, Jason Moore, and Carrie T. Ball Jr. Um, we learned that there were a number of uh, similar issues that families faced. Um, they often face a callous police department that refuses to provide information on their loved one's death. Uh, there's a lack of legal advocacy, either uh, in terms of attorneys who are able to file civil rights claims on behalf of families or uh, looking to the criminal legal system, uh, prosecutors who are willing to investigate deaths as well as um, pursue prosecutions. Uh, and finally, families have a range of issue, issues around um, how to pay for things like funerals, how to access uh, social services, mental health support. These were all the things that we found as we interviewed families and served as the basis of our, of our research. Um, you'll see on the screen that we have uh, snippets from some of our social media that was released over the last few days uh, from 
family members of those, uh, those who had lost loved ones. Um, today, we are very grateful that we um, have Tony Taylor, Carrie T. Ball Jr.'s mother with us, Marlene Gephardt, Tyler Gephardt's grandmother, and Gina Torres, Isaiah's mother. So if you could unmute. Um, I just want to start by thanking you for joining us today. Um, and if we could start with Tony, um, if you could just introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit more about yourself and your loved one. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tony Taylor. I'm the mother of Carrie Ball Jr. Um, I also have three other surviving children, two sons and one daughter. And that's the reason why I fight so hard in this fight because I wanna make sure that they are safe. I don't want them to be shot down in the streets like a dog um, just for going to the store or running an errand or anything. And I feel like the police need to do better with community engagement so they can know the people in the area where they are patrolling that. And that's the reason why I'm here and want to participate in with this state violence against police officers today. Thank you so much. Do I speak a little bit about what happened to Carrie? Um, but yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Carrie was my firstborn son. At the age of 25 in 2013, Carrie was shot a total of 21 times out of 32 bullets. To me, that was excessive force. I thought something was going to be done about that shooting, but I see that once your child or loved one is taken from you by police brutality, there's really nothing that you can do. It's so political. I didn't know that. Um, actually, I didn't even pay attention to police brutality before I lost Carrie. The only case that caught my attention was Ayanna Stanley Jones. And I don't know if that was because she was a seven year old little girl or that she was just a kid. I don't know what about it with that story. But in 2015, I had the pleasure of meeting her grandmother, the one who led her fight. I actually met her at one of Michael Brown Mother's um, Rainbow or Mother's Retreat. And she was seated next to me. And when we sat down and we started talking to one another, when she introduced who she was, my heart fell. Because never in life did I think I would be in a police brutality fight, nor meeting one of the surviving fighters of another police brutality case. And that was the only one that stuck out. So I felt like that was God that brought us together under a tragedy. Earlier this month, she lost, Ayanna Stanley Jones' grandmother lost her life to an illness. Her funeral was just this past weekend. It hurted me real bad that I couldn't go to Detroit to go to see her because we had connected so deeply in between those years. And what I wanna say about this fight and with this grief is that grief can cause different illnesses to lead up to death. So us as the surviving families, if we don't take care of ourselves, we cannot stand strong to fight for our loved ones. And I just want everybody to think about that. Take time out to figure out what it is you need to do for yourself so you can be able to stand up and fight another day for your loved one. Fighting for these last eight years for Carrie has took a real big toll on my body. But this time, I'm going to step back a little bit and get my health in order. Because after Matilda dying gave me an eye opener, then maybe I should check on my own health so I could be able to take another day to fight for Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And I, um, I know I've said it in different contexts, but you have inspired me and I know so many others, given all of the work that you do, not only for your own family, but also for so many others. Um, and I, our hope is that this program will be adding um, support for mothers like yourself um, and the others that we will hear from today. Uh, if we can go, our next uh, person would be 
uh, Marlene Gephardt, Tyler's grandmother. If you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit uh, about Tyler as well. And you're on mute, just make sure. Thanks for having me today. Um, it's not a place I wanted to be. Um, I'm Marlene Gebhardt and I'm Tyler Gebhardt's grandmother. Tyler was a 20 year old um, college student when he was um, taken from us, killed by allegedly a police officer in the home of the youth minister of the church he attended. Tyler was an amazing young man who was loved by his mother, his stepfather, his grandfather, his aunts, uncles, sisters. Um, he was generous, he was kind, he was an amazing, amazing kid. And the shock of losing him was so intense that it took several days just to be able to function. One of the things that I would say I think that Tony said very well is you're just reeling and don't really realize, you know, what's actually happened to you. And it takes a while to start to process. Um, in Tyler's case, we didn't even know where his body was for several days. Um, that's horrifying to me. I can't stress enough how this changed me and my view of the system. One that, because I come from a family of 10 police officers, I was devastated by what I now know is a very incredible lack of justice in the system. And I don't think it's a lack of justice as much as it is it's designed that way. One of the things, Emmanuel, you ask me to speak about, and, and I will, is the whole attorney issue that we encountered. And in an effort to be brief, I will tell you this. Um, we talked to probably five, six different law firms. One of them, eventually we heard is now representing the St. Louis County Police Union. That was a huge shock to me. Another one um, for basically said to us that um, suing a policeman, which I'd never ask him to do, um, is almost impossible task, but for $10,000, he would gladly uh, write a paper and speak to the media for me. Another one said to me for somewhere between 80 and 100,000, they would investigate the case. And when I told Thomas and, and Blake that, they were, the look on their face was just shock. They couldn't believe it until I showed them the documents that that was actually what they wanted to help us. And then, I talked to Blake and I don't want to embarrass him, but one of the things he said to me that day was what is your grandson's name and how old was he? And then he said to me, I am so very sorry. And his passion at that moment and his sympathy was the first time anyone had ever even said that to me. And I knew at that moment that no matter what, I wanted Arch City Defenders to represent us and help us on this path. Um, and finally, the prosecutor in Tyler's case, when we finally got a meeting with him, Tyler was killed July 9th, 2016. The first time we met with the prosecutor was in February of 2017. And three times in that meeting, and Michael was there, three times in that meeting, and, and my daughter, Tyler's um, mom, Angela, was with me. The prosecutor inaccurately described details 
about Tyler's case. He didn't even know basic information about Tyler's case. I was horrified that someone could tell me that Tyler's homicide was justified when he didn't even know basic information. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, Marlene. And I just want to name, um, and I think I can speak on behalf of Arch City, how grateful we are that you decided to allow us to be stand with you um, on this journey. And we, as always, hope that we are able to get some form of justice. Um, and thank you again for supporting us throughout this project. Uh, so I'll turn to Gina Torres, the mother of Isaiah Hammett. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for asking me to join today. My son, my name is Gina Torres, and my son's Isaiah Hammett. He was 21, um, and he was uh, killed by a no-knock raid uh, by SWAT. Um, It's, it's really hard uh, to even talk about my son and what happened, especially when um, it's by the ones that's supposed to protect us. Uh, me and my family, my son had two uh, surviving brothers and a sister who's a senior now, is about to graduate. And last time she seen my son was her eighth grade graduation. So it, it takes a toll on your family. Not only losing my son who fought to come into this world, but is no longer here to uh, watch his brothers and sisters. Um, he saved my father's life. Uh, he was my father's caretaker. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, no, take your time. No worries. My son had always uh, had problems. Uh, anytime we've had uh, called, just because of his last name. Uh, it's sad to say that I was always scared of that phone call because of the police always harassing my son because um, who his father is. Uh, after they had killed my son, they had uh, harassed me for a long time. Uh, they surround my house. Uh, I've been, I was arrested three weeks after they killed my son when I was protesting my son. I couldn't see my son. What I seen of him wasn't just covers all around him pretty much. I had his funeral four months later. What hurts the most is they never gave me the chance to kiss my son and touch him and say goodbye. I'm sorry, guys. It's hard. No, it's totally fine. Um, and why I'm doing this is because if I can help save another family from going through the pain of the families that is on here and what well, the pain we go through, I never wish it on no one. It's like I said, it's like, how are our children, like my children, like how are they supposed to be, or think like if something happened, like to call the police. They ain't gonna call the police because the police killed the brother. Like, I mean, I have family in my, in my family who is police officers. And it, it's just, it's, it, it, you'd never think as much killing as they do, 
from the ones that protect us that they just they keep getting away with it and they just keep killing more and more kids families and they don't care like they get to go home and kiss their kids good night i'll never get another birthday i'll never get another picture of my son but the last picture of him and my kids on my daughter's graduation and he was 21 years old i'll never get a grandchild that's why i'm on here and i fight the reason i'm still alive or here is because of my kids and my father that's what makes me try to be strong to fight and go on thank you thank you so much gina and i um as we transition i just want to name and i think conversations that we've had in the past is that um, while we sometimes will see families, we'll put them out, we'll talk about their experiences, but in some contexts, they're not part of, the, they're not at the table telling us what should be done, how we should be doing this work. Um, our aspiration has always been that the families that we connect with, your experiences guide the work that we end up doing, um, that we continue to connect with you and to update you on the work and get your feedback, um, you know, to get your advice. So that is our aspiration. We do not ask you to come up here to tell your story just for the sake of this. Your fight is important to us um, and we will fight with you. And so I just wanna thank you all again for uh, making time um, to work with us over the years on this project um, and to name that it, again, it, it's your experiences that are guiding our work here. Um, and then just to one of the things that you will see in our press releases and whatnot is that the conversations that we had uh, going back to 2018 are part of a forthcoming guide for families. Um, and so we'll talk more about the different aspects of the work, but that's one of the things that's also coming out of these stories beyond the project itself. Okay, thank you everyone. So we'll, um, I think one of the things Gina said is, um, a good way to talk about the next section. So we were able to do um, an analysis of uh, the incidents of killings by police in St. Louis from 2009, 2019, and then also looked at deaths in custody. As Gina mentioned, officers keep killing. So despite um, all of the work that we're doing and it is being done to organize and to challenge these issues, despite national outcry, the numbers continue to rise. The number of families that are harmed continue to rise. Um, and we want to be able to memorialize and capture that for the St. Louis region. So that's why we say this is an unprecedented um, regional data set uh, collecting a range of information, uh, both on jail custody deaths and killings by police. Um, what we found was that we identified 132 people who were killed in this region. Um, you'll see on the chart that's here that ranges anywhere between five to 18 people uh, being killed by officers in the St. Louis region every year. The thing to note, and uh, you know, we come with humility because we know that these numbers are not correct. Uh, they are dependent upon a review of media, uh, public records requests. We requested information from multiple police departments, reviewing other websites, uh, things like Fatal Encounters, which tracks um, killings. And this, uh, what we know though, is that uh, we don't have first information from the police generally. Uh, that means that there are stories that are not here. One of the things we'll say at the end is if you are family on the line or you know of a family that's not captured um, in our data, which is available on our website, uh, you know, let us know so that we're able to add to this list. Um, the thing Blake mentioned earlier also was that uh, this number, if you look at the population of St. Louis, this is an exceptionally high number. Um, so we have more killings uh, by police per population than any of any major metro area in the United States. Uh, what we found was that uh, just breaking into some demographics, the overwhelming majority were men. It's about 92%. 8% um, of those killed were women. 
Um, and there was one trans woman in that number. Uh, if we look at the data in terms of race, uh, again, 72% were Black, African American. Um, the next was uh, white at 19%. Despite all of our research, we were unable to identify 5% uh, in terms of their race, 3% Asian, 1% Hispanic. Unfortunately, this tracks uh, to some degree the national data, which notes that African Americans, specifically looking at Black men, are disproportionately likely to be killed by police. Uh, in terms of zip codes, uh, for those who are familiar with St. Louis, we identified four of the deadliest zip codes. Uh, that's 63118 in South St. Louis City, um, 63113, which is in North St. Louis City, uh, 63147 in the northeastern border of the city, and then 63136, which is in the county, uh, just north of the city border. Um, Finally, uh, we'd be remiss to not name uh, that we do have some data in regards to individuals who died in jail custody. We were able to identify 47, uh, 38 were men and nine were women. Um, the youngest person that we were able to identify was 20, the oldest being 62. Um, and then of the 47 folks who died, 20 were black, 21 white, and six we were not able to identify their race. We, had, we named this um, because it's hard to get information generally, but specifically on these deaths, but want to raise that up, especially given the work that we are doing, for example, with Close the Workhouse campaign to close uh, the workhouse here in St. Louis, a local jail, that there are there's a lot of death coming out of those institutions as well. It's not just police. Uh, so the person I'm about to introduce, I'm really excited. Um, to have speak with everyone uh, to give us context um, and understand that this is not a problem that just started uh, even uh, six years ago. Uh, her name is Ashley Jackson. Um, she is uh, getting in a graduate program at the Washington University in St. Louis. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley uh, to introduce herself and then also explain to us about her research mapping historical police violence in St. Louis. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, and my Wi-Fi is a little bit unstable. I keep getting a notification. So if I fall off the grid, then let me know and maybe I can just call back in. Um, but hopefully you, can, you guys can hear me uh, clear. Um, so again, I'm so happy to be here. I, it's a little hard for me to transition because um, I'm still feeling a lot of, a lot of emotion. Marlene, uh, Gina, and Tony's um, testimonies. I want to thank you for sharing that because I know that that takes a lot of courage. So. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm a, a doctoral student, PhD student at Washington University in St. Louis in the Brown School of Social Work. Um, and I've done a lot of criminal justice research over the years, primarily in New York City. Um, and sort of what led me to this point is I did a lot of research on um, kids that were incarcerated in New York State, but also looked at New York City um, in areas where police were particularly uh, had a high presence. So we looked at the impact of stop and frisk policies, but at the time, NYPD was getting sued um, for racial profiling, a number of black and brown kids throughout the city. And so while I was at the Vera Institute of Justice, um, we were kind of interested in learning about what impact is this having on young kids of color, right? Like I knew from personal experience um, that those interactions are, they, they cannot be good. Um, they have really harmful effects, but we wanted to sort of hear from the young folks uh, from their perspectives. And so this kind of like led me to where I'm at now, because um, I have to be honest at the time, doing research in the New York City context, I was sort of focused on cross-sectional data. So like point in time, how kids and families are feeling about sort of interactions with the police in that period of time, not necessarily taking this sort of historical approach. I didn't necessarily think about it as um, sort of a long uh, sort of heinous legacy of racialized violence in this country. And so that kind of led me to where I'm at now. Um, and so I currently focus at WashU um, on historical and contemporary patterns of police violence. And then what psychological effects just having adverse interactions with police as in the black family system and then in turn sort of how that connects with how um you know how we talk to our loved ones about when you interact with the police what do you do right that socialization that racial socialization about how to interact with the police in order to to stay safe um, and so i want to share my screen um, to walk you through this website that i recently built um, that that emmanuel was mentioning and it's basically uh, I map historical patterns of police violence, specifically in St. Louis City. Um, and 
the data derived from archival data from the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU of Missouri, and these records go all the way back to 1930 up until 2015. Um, but at the time during like the late uh, 1960s into the early 1980s, the ACLU of Missouri was really interested in um, uh, you know, uh, litigating and advocating against uh, uh, fatal uh, police shootings of St. Louis civilians, trying to figure out why so many of these incidents were happening, right? So this incident obviously didn't start in the 1970s. It's been since the beginning of this country's history, but the ACLU was really focused on this 19, uh, late 1960s, early 1980s time period. So this website, which I'll walk you through, and I'm happy to drop the link in the chat in case folks are interested in, in sort of exploring it themselves, um, is it's just a, a, a walks you through the archival data that I looked at um, when building out this website. And this is a letter that the ACL uh, uh, used, um, and they drafted up in the late 1970s to sort of uh, think about how to approach this issue. And so they wanted to track the number of people killed by the police, under what circumstances, how many officers um, died in these pursuits, and what officers were involved. And if there's specific police departments and officers that are continually involved in these same shootings, um, there's some recent research out now that sort of argues against this case of it's not just one bad cop, right? It's one bad apple that spoils the whole bunch. And they've been able to sort of draw connections between um, police officers that have track records of police misconduct and how that gets diffused to other police officers um, throughout the department. And so this is sort of the, the part that I think is, is the most interesting. So between 1969 and 1981, you'll see on the left-hand side are the incidents of police shootings in St. Louis um, during 1969 and 1981. And then this sort of black and grayish shading are the black population in based on the 1970 census. And then on the right-hand side, these are 2000 uh, to 2000 things from the 2010 census, the black population. And the big take home, take home uh, from, from this, this map is that over time, uh, as black uh, folks migrated from the northern part of the city to the southeastern part, the number of incidents of, of fatal encounters or police shootings with um, police shootings of civilians increases, right? So, you know, as we're moving throughout the city, cops are continuing continuing to take our lives and our loved ones. And, you know, this sort of uh, displays what Emmanuel gets at, right? That like police violence, unfortunately, is not, it's not an issue of 2020. I think a lot of people had sort of an awakening that police violence is an issue, but for advocates, um, for researchers, um, for racial justice sort of warriors, we've always known these things to be true, right? Um, and we have a lot of evidence, both anecdotally from, from stories that we all carry with us of, are the fears that we have of law enforcement, but we can sort of see this systematically too, that over time, these incidents and these locations um, where these police shootings are happening um, remain the same, um, particularly tied to the Black population. And I think this, this sort of triangulates well with the data that Emmanuel and his colleagues have, have found at our city defenders too. Further down on the website, and again, this website was built by a team of one, so I still have to build it out a little bit more, but I focused in on a neighborhood, um, the Ville, which I think was also uh, you guys found at RTD Defenders, uh, where a lot of police shootings were happening between 1969 and 1981, as well as 2000 and 2020. And so you scroll down a little bit more, these are just a little bit more about um, the individuals who were unfortunately harmed by law enforcement in the 1970s, in 2013, in 2000, and it sort of walks you block by block of where these incidents are happening. And so, you know, some people respond, uh, some people fall asleep when they see charts with, with bar graphs and things like that. And for me, I thought visualizing, um, you know, some of these incidents tells them, you know, a powerful story in another, in another way to, to show you that over time, um, this persistent racialized violence continues to happen. Um, and that this is not just an issue of the past, right? This is an issue that continues to happen. Um, and, can, and it can also lend itself uh, to other to other sort of realizations, right? I think a lot of people don't understand why communities of color mistrust the police, like Gina mentioned. Why, if we're in trouble, why calling 911 isn't really our first uh, uh, response, right? It's because it's this entrenched fear and this historical um, persistence of, of racialized violence. So, um, so that's my website, and I'll drop the link in the box. Um, I mean, I don't know if I tackled all the questions. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add uh, quickly is if there are gaps, you think generally 
in the research that's happening at a national level or that's happening locally that as we take this work on, we should be thinking about um, or hoping to fill that gap? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the most obvious one, and you know, I think uh, organizations like RCD Defenders and other entities.org mapping to some is we need a federal, federally mandated database on uh, every time the police harms an individual. Um, and it needs to be externally housed. I, I think currently, I don't know if we can necessarily trust that all police departments are going to report every time they harm an individual. So it needs to be some sort of external uh, external entity. Um, that's what we need, number one. And then I also think the way in which we define police violence has to be, um, we have to measure it more concisely. It's not just physical force, right? It's not just um, you know dying at the hands of law enforcement or, or being physically shoved. It's psychological abuse as well. Um, it's sexual violence that, that happens. Uh, it's neglect, it's calling the police and instead of them solving problems, they just create more problems. Those are, those are forms of abuse, I would argue, that should be um, defined um, if, we're, if we're gonna start tracking this in a more systematic way. Um, and then I also think that, you know, a historical reflection is important to take, not only with police violence, but with all social issues that, that impact historically marginalized groups, um, to just learn about lessons learned, to not repeat the past, um, to sort of learn from what we've what we've done in the past and, and forge more sustainable interventions in the future. Um, and then I think the most important thing is is understanding, which I think the families have done so well of like just understanding the, the collateral effects of this. It's not just the individual who loses their life or his harm. Um, police violence permeates communities at the family system level, at the community level, and also generationally. I think that I would argue that, that it sort of perpetuates generational trauma. Um, and it, and I think that, you know, Black people and, and uh, Latino people in general's fears of law enforcement and state actors, I think are remnants of that trauma, right? So we know that, um, you know, that interacting with law enforcement may not always uh, end in a positive note. And, so, and that's a trauma response. And so I think recognizing that and how that perpetuates um, generationally is another gap that, that we have to continue to work to, to fill and address. Great. Well, thank you so much. I was so excited to see your research as we were um, embarking on this journey of pulling this data and excited to work with each other in the future. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen again, and we're going to switch to talking about the media itself. Uh, just as a brief introduction, this is a, a player um, in the field here that we often maybe don't talk about. What is the role of the media as it relates to fatal state violence? How do they interact with families or not? Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Emma Clar, who's a former Arch City intern, uh, and ask you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the research that you did around media content here in St. Louis. All right. Uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Clark, and I was an intern in 2019. Um, and so kind of when I came to Arch City, this project was very much in the in the phase of talking to families and, and conducting those interviews that Emmanuel had had started and, and that other people had been carrying on. And I think that something that came up in a lot of family interviews um, with uh, family members was their negative interactions with the media and and the incorrect narratives about their family members that the media was perpetuating and that kind of is what led to us following along on this research and and sort of diving deeper into um, into this sort of media content analysis. Um, so like many people have said, uh, there is such a lack of information. We're unable to find out when police are perpetuating violence, when people are killed by police, and the media is often kind of the only place where these incidents of fatal state violence are, are kind of reported and are um, found. And the fact that in many cases, the articles written about these incidents are very one-sided and very much favor police narratives and favor kind of narratives that the state is trying to push um, very much erases uh, who the victim was as a person, it erases the struggles the family is going through, and it it perpetuates that cycle of violence and ensures that the um, 
the incidents keep on happening. Uh, so the research that, that kind of we did with this media content analysis covered 115 articles that were published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch because sort of the Post-Dispatch is one of the most widely read news sources here in St. Louis. Um, and they were the articles written immediately after each victim's death by police. And we basically looked at different characteristics that made up the articles, such as kind of whether quotes were included or the specific words or phrases that were used in the articles, such as things like authorities say to refer to police or justified killing or feared for their life that kind of create this overall narrative and this overall picture of the fatal state violence incidents. And as kind of, as um, I did this and as I read through a lot of the articles, it became very clear that the sort of overall script that journalists used to write about incidents of fatal state violence has stayed essentially the same over the last 10 plus years. Um, and that they've depended very heavily on these sort of one-sided and racist and dangerous narratives to talk about police and the people that they kill. Um, so they use sort of the same outline, the same word choice and the same reliance on primary information directly from police. And that resulted in several of our key findings in the report um, that I'm going to kind of run through here um, very briefly, because obviously there's a lot, of, a lot of data and a lot of information that came out of this and, and is all in the larger report. So kind of the first thing that we found was that the media criminalizes the majority of victims. Uh, the automatic sort of response is to paint the victim of an incident of fatal state violence as a criminal, as someone who kind of deserved to have this interaction with law enforcement. And the articles do this by kind of repeating uh, sort of allegations that that um, the individual and the victim had a gun or, or was involved in drugs and kind of creates this narrative that that the person was um, was a criminal. Um, so for example, this first uh, statistic here that we found that that victims of police shootings in particular, um, compared to sort of individuals who died in, in jail custody or individuals who died after kind of car crashes with police, those articles dealing with victims of police shootings were almost four times more likely to include previous crimes that the victim was convicted for or even sort of allegedly committed. So there was this very deliberate attempt as kind of incidents of police violence were more kind of obvious and, and the police kind of had the potential to, to appear as the villain. Um, there was a very large sort of push against that in, in kind of vilifying the, uh, the victim even more. And so then the second takeaway uh, that we had was that the articles then rarely included any positive alternative characteristics of the victim. It very, uh, very often doesn't mention family members. It doesn't mention their roles in society or in their family or in their community outside of this sort of characterization as a criminal. So very few articles mention their level of educational attainment, mention their level of, um, or mention their employment status or, or anything like that, that could provide a more three-dimensional picture of the victim. Uh, and then the third takeaway was that the articles consistently prioritize police statements over those made by victims' families if statements by victims' families were, were even recorded at all in the articles. Uh, so there's been a dependence in journalism on what is viewed as kind of legitimate sources or kind of these objective sources that very much equates to kind of the, the, state, the state sources. It's the kind of system that is in place and the system that has the power in society. So that results in these newspaper articles quoting police, quoting uh, police chiefs, police spokespersons, or specific officers, rather than quoting families and quoting people who knew the victim. So we kind of measured that both with uh, word count of quotes by police versus quotes by family members. 
and we found that the quotes by police had a total word count that was nearly twice the total of the family word count. So it was a very stark difference um, between kind of the amount of space that was provided for police viewpoints versus family viewpoints. Um, so then our, our kind of fourth takeaway is that this absolutely um, kind of was seen along uh, racialized lines. There, the black victims were criminalized far more frequently in these articles than white victims. Uh, in, in articles about black victims of police violence, the trends like cr criminalization and the mentioning of previous crimes and the mentioning of drugs was far more likely to occur uh, than if, if the article was dealing with white victims. And additionally, quotes from white families were given more space in articles and were prioritized far more than uh, in articles about black victims and with black families. And the final takeaway, or sorry, the fifth takeaway is that the articles rarely provided any context or explained that these incidents of fatal state violence are part of a larger system and a larger structure of anti-Blackness, of racial oppression, and of state violence. They were very much treated as individual incidents and uh, instances of, of kind of police doing their job and police upholding law and order. And this was very obvious because 81% of all of these articles were published in the law and order section of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which normalizes this idea of killing and fails to make the connection between, um, between these, these individual deaths and this larger failed model of public safety in St. Louis that, that allows the state to continue to take lives. Um, and so then our final takeaway is that the articles overwhelmingly protected the identities of police officers while exposing victims and their families to scrutiny and, and often danger. So over the last, over the 10 years that this, that this study covered, there were only eight instances where the articles mentioned the name of the police officer. They, they were very rarely included and, and kind of maintained this insular culture that protected the police officer and prevented there from being any accountability. And those same articles that protected the police officer that didn't report those names very frequently failed to do so for the family members. So 85% of articles revealed the name of the victim. And even more shockingly, to me at least, 75% of those articles, of those 115 articles, gave information about where the victim lived. And that could even include the full address where the victim had lived and where family members often still did live, which created a lack of privacy for family members and also exposure to danger um, by disclosing that information. So I think overall what this media content analysis did was paint a very worrying picture of reporting that, that painted police narratives as fact and didn't seek out any of these alternate perspectives or voices to challenge fatal state violence as a problem rather than just a fact in St. Louis. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this information is critical as we talk about all of the different actors engaged. We've heard from the families, for example, Marlene talking about how us lawyers um, fail families. Uh, so definitely bringing this out of side, outside of the narrative of just one officer with one person, that this is a systemic issue and that there are a lot of players in this system. Um, so we're going to switch then to talk a little bit about the officers. Um, we were able to identify 80 different officers who were reported to be directly involved in the deaths of individuals in the St. Louis region. This is clearly not correct. There are many more who were involved, but this is what we were able to find uh, given our public records requests, the information we were able to back up with uh, media sources. Uh, and as Emma mentioned, Generally, it's really, uh, at least at the beginning stages and then potentially moving forward, hard to identify who were the officers involved. One of the things we noticed in our research, we were able to do uh, public records requests of different 
police departments, but noticing, for example, with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, our local city uh, police, after about 2017, the majority of public records no longer have a narrative that talks about what happened. They simply say this has been transitioned to the force investigative unit, which is a unit in SLMPD. What that means is it's unclear uh, what officers were involved, what were their steps, that information is not available to the public. But from what we were able to identify, uh, this list includes officers who engaged in vehicular chases, shot and killed, tased people, and even an officer who pushed a man down the stairs to his death. I'll quickly name that uh, in terms of accountability, we were not able to see uh, individuals who uh, were criminally charged, convicted, and incarcerated. Uh, these are three that we were able to identify, and you can learn more about them in our report. Um, I'll also name that we only identified two individuals who were actually decommissioned. So here in Missouri, they're no longer allowed to act as police officers. Uh, Christine Miller, who is here, was one of those. I'm going to turn it to uh, John Chasnoff, who is a member of the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression. Um, just want to name, and we'll talk more about the overall program, but CAPCAR, as it's known, has been a partner from the beginning, introducing us to families, um, and they've been doing amazing work for years. We really stand on their shoulders as we launch into this project. Um, John, I'd love if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and then the work uh, at CAPCAR. Sure, um, very honored to be here today. Um, uh, I've been with the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression since 1999 um, and am currently co-chair of the organization along with uh, Jamala Rogers. Uh, it's a multiracial organization uh, that works under black leadership and um, has been doing this work on police accountability um, since 1983. Um, the organization started over a police shooting. Um, it was Joseph Ferraro, who was a member of the St. Louis City Police Department and was recklessly chasing and firing um, at a young man who was running down the street and killed an innocent woman who was sitting on her porch, Marilyn Banks. Um, so CAPCAR formed at that time to support um, the family of Marilyn Banks and to uh, bring some accountability. Um, Joseph Ferraro was the first officer. Um, my, my understanding is he was the first officer in the history of St. Louis to be indicted. Um, and then they moved, they did a change of venue and moved that trial to Kansas City where he was acquitted. Um, so it was a step forward historically, but not ultimately justice for that family. Um, but CAPCAR has worked um, since 1983 with um, a number of families. Um, one of our main missions is to support surviving families and to help them navigate this very difficult system as it's been described today. Um, families are thrust into uh, these situations without any preparation or kind of knowledge of the landscape or, um, and so when we can contact families, we kind of help sort that, that those issues out. What are their immediate needs? Does the family need psychological counseling? Do they need uh, help finding an attorney? Um, do they want to, uh, and we kind of lay out kind of a future, future options for them. Um, do they want to work on the media narrative around, you know, this criminalization that has often happened of their loved one and, and kind of push back with a different media strategy and narrative? Um, do they want to file a civil suit? Do they want to, um, do they, you know, if their loved one survived, maybe there's a criminal case that they have to defend. So we try to lay out those options and let the family choose their own path forward because, you know, some families want to become activists, other families don't. Sometimes they'll thank us for the information and that's the end of our contact or other times we will work with families over a number of years to try to find justice. Thank you so much, John. And one, just one question I have just generally when you look back over your time and CAPCAR's general experience, um, just the question of accountability, how realistic is accountability, be it in the civil system or the criminal system, or if we have alternative systems, 
Um, so one question, how realistic is that for a family? And then separately, what are we doing um, or what's happening, so to speak, on the ground to try to create some form of accountability today? Yeah, um, I mean, the odds are of achieving justice are pretty long. And so we do spell that out to families. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a long struggle. Um, and it's going to have heartache along the way. Um, we have had successes. Um, like I mentioned, Joseph Ferraro was indicted. Um, in the case of Jerome Johnson, who was shot seven times and survived, uh, he was charged with assaulting officers. and. Um, partly because of our pushback against that story and digging for the truth, he was acquitted of those charges. Um, so um, there was a, a shooting in Wellston, in, in, I'm sorry, in Pagedale, involving an officer who was part of what we call the Muni Hop, who had jumped from department to department um, shooting people. And um, we, chased him around the metropolitan area and ultimately got him out of policing, uh, at least for a time. And so there are victories to point to along the way, but um, there's often, you know, we don't always achieve ultimate victory, but we are successful, I think, in, in helping families in the support they need and in knowing that there is, you know, people, there are people out there who care about their loved one and who will support them in the struggle. Um, and those are important victories as well. Um, it, if you want to know a little bit about some of our current work, um, one of the things we were overwhelmed with the number of cases that we had to deal with. And in the early 2000s, we decided that we really couldn't handle the flood of cases that were coming our way and needed to try to approach the problem systemically as well as for, on individual cases. And so we began, a, we turned into a 15 year campaign for a civilian oversight board in the city. Um, we got that oversight board, it's functioning to some extent, but not to the full extent it should be. And so we continue to be doing oversight of the oversight board to make sure that there are civilian eyes um, on that work and making sure police are held accountable in that system. Um, also with the individual families, depending on the nature of the case, we work on different aspects of accountability. So in Tony's case, a lot of the focus has been on getting the circuit attorney to um, open up the case and do a real solid investigation um, and possibly still you know, bring charges against the officers involved. Um, in Isaiah Hammett's case with Gina, a lot of the focus has been on SWAT and the nature of this no-knock raid that happened at their house. And uh, we've learned that a lot of the shootings in St. Louis take are, are perpetrated by officers who are either currently members of SWAT or future members of SWAT. Um, and so the connection there is very strong and we've been trying to bring that to light as well as support her in a, in a civil case. Um, so there is the individual foc focuses that come about with the nature of our interactions with the family. Um, and finally, we've been continuing to work on this whole question of how the investigations happen and where they should happen structurally. Um, the Civilian Oversight Board was a first step, but we really need to get um, the investigations of these shootings out of the hands of the police departments because we can't have police investigating themselves. And so um, currently involved in putting together a campaign to um, move those investigations and the force investigative unit as well out of the police department and put the, um, the responsibility for investigations in the circuit attorney's office. Um, and so those are all steps we're taking in terms of mitigation of the problem. But I also wanna point out that ultimately we need to reduce the interactions between police and citizens. And that involves um, a larger campaign to defund the police, to take things off their place at plates and move a lot of responsibilities that we currently put on police, move those responsibilities to social service agencies and other uh, functions where people's needs will be um, better met. And that's our campaign that we've been doing called Reimagining Public Safety and um, working with a coalition of organizations on defunding the police. 
Thank you so much, John. I, um, as always, inspired by the work that you, CAPCAR, and so many um, community organizations here are doing. I also appreciate you naming Defund the Police. It reminds me to name that our city orients ourselves from a perspective of revolutionary justice. We don't believe that law is the final arbiter of justice. And just like you mentioned, so often it fails to provide information to families and vet quality investigation, independent investigation, or any form of accountability. But we recognize that it is one of the tools that we have. And so that's why we lift it up. Um, and as you mentioned, there are mitigation strategies that we will focus on with broader goals to eventually defund the police and move into a future state where we have real public safety because we know the police do not provide it. Um, so I will uh, move then to our cost analysis section and I will turn it to my colleague Z Gorley, who is our communications director. See if you could introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about um, this analysis. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, and thank you to everybody who has been connected and speaking on this issue. Um, my name is Z Gorley. I'm the communications director at Arch City Defenders. And um, I'm really humbled and honored to be part of this work, um, the Fatal State Violence Project, as well as the um, policy report that we released today, which is entitled Death by the State. Um, which is on police killings, jail deaths, and um, centers the stories of impacted families. Um, we, uh, part of what I wanna just mention um, is that, um, and if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, so in the spirit of MLK Day, um, I was remembering a quote that's often attributed to MLK, which is that, Budgets are moral documents. And so we spend money on what we value, right? So, um, you know, if we value Netflix, we might spend money to have it. Um, and so when we kind of zoom out and think about the public realities of that for cities, cities also spend money on what they value. And we know from data from um, a report entitled Freedom to Thrive, which came out a few years ago, that cities in jurisdictions like St. Louis County, St. Louis City, as well as across the country, have spent the past few decades investing in um, a model of public safety that is defined by, um, to John's point, um, and Emmanuel's just now, by policing, arresting, prosecuting, and jailing poor, mainly poor people and people of color. Um, and that those uh, frequency of interactions are because of um, these publicly funded institutions and personnel that are so uh, prevalent in our, in our landscapes. Um, what we did, and if you could head to the next slide, was um, as you'll find in the report and as you've seen through some of the data in this presentation, um, St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department in St. Louis City um, kills the most, is known to kill the most people per capita. And so for the cost analysis part, um, there is a focus on this particular jurisdiction. And without getting too into the weeds of the numbers, what I want to point out is that um, our tax dollars generally go to a bucket called the general fund budget, which is in theory what funds um, many of our departments and public services. But as you see in this pie chart here, there is um, a strong emphasis, 36% of these general fund dollars go directly to policing. Um, and so that is definitely part of this issue that um, you know we really hope to convey as we have these conversations about fatal state violence. Um, and something I want to note that you'll find in the report is that um, cities that are of a comparable size to St. Louis have um, an average of 24 police to 10,000 residents. But when you look at what that ratio is for St. Louis, it's about 62 police officers to 10,000 residents. So. Um, again, back to the frequency of those interactions um, and where that issue stems from. What this means is that with all this focus on um, police spending, that there isn't money for mental health resources, basic services, et cetera. And so you have someone like Julius or Jules Graves, um, who we include in the report, um, who is a black man in St. Louis resident who in 2006 was pepper sprayed and beaten 
um, and during a mental health crisis in 2006. Tragically, 13 years later, um, his life ended um, and uh, he, it ended by um, police tasing him. And so in 2006, um, the response to his mental health, the mental, excuse me, the mental health episode he was having was that police brutality. Um, and in 2019, um, unfortunately, uh, he was killed as a result of police being um, uh, brutal and tasing him again and leading to his death. Um, what this all means to me, and I think what this really helps us to, to really think about is how are we defining public safety? And certainly in 2020, um, we heard calls in St. Louis and across the country to defund the police. And my, our hope is that um, folks on this, on this call and who watch this you know, presentation um, and are, are engaged here, remain engaged and are civically active, that you're talking to your elected and appointed officials um, to really advocate um, based on what you know about how public spending um, happens where you live. And um, yeah, Emmanuel, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Z. Um, and what I think is really powerful about what you mentioned is, well, what are our next steps? Where are we going? And we want to go there. Uh, but first, we are very lucky that Carlos Ball um, was able to join us. At, and again, our aspiration here is to center the families and to um, create a platform for us to actually support them. So I want to give Carlos uh, a moment to introduce himself and talk. Um, Carlos, are you there so we can? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Could you tell us a little bit more about you know, who you are and the, um, your journey as well since your, since your loss? Um, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, for creating this platform um, for the families and everyone, you know, to come together so, uh, to have this discussion because it is a major problem in our community uh, and a lot of our communities all around the nation. So I want to say thank you. And again, uh, my name is Carlos Ball. I am the brother of Kerry Ball Jr. Um, so since he, my brother has passed, my journey to fight for justice has been kind of up and down. Um, initially, when he first passed, he first got killed, um, I was in the state of denial, you know, it just put me in a real bad um, space, you know, like, it definitely brought on the de depression. Um, but immediately after those things, it um, helped kick in a bit of activism work. Um, so I immediately started fighting for justice for my brother. Um, and not just for my brother, but for everyone else. You know, I um, did as much as I can to get out there with the people in our community who uh, when we had the uprisings and for uh, not just for support, but because it was for me personally, because I knew what it felt like as a sibling losing your brother, your first friend, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, your brothers, uh, your siblings more than, you know, um, anybody especially when you're that close, me and Carrie are only a year and a half apart. But um, it kicked in my activism work. Um, I knew I didn't want to just let my brother die in vain. I had to continue to keep his name alive and try to do as much as I can to help people um, who have either experienced this um, <clears throat> or not only just experienced this, but try to be proactive and help kind of curve it some, you know, by being proactive in some of our approaches with um, dealing with some of the people in our community and even the police officers. But um, one thing that it has made me do, it made me really get in touch with the human service field. My brother uh, was in, currently was in college when he was killed. Um, he had a 3.86 grade point average. And um, he was a, he was majoring in human services. So I, I began working in that field and I've been um, working as a mentor, case manager, um, job developer helping young adults in our uh, community, find resources, jobs, help them get in uh, occupational training, things of that nature. So I have tried to do things to keep myself from 
thinking about it because some now it had been almost eight years. I do find myself often, you know, drifting off into uh, my feelings and feeling a sense of like, what now? Because it's been eight years and now I feel like I won't get to see him as my big brother anymore because now I'm past the age he, that he was when he passed. So it's kind of hard looking towards the future and seeing where you're going to go. But um, as long as we continue, you know, to support each other, um, do what we can to fight for justice for all. And one thing that um, I believe John spoke on was taking the power away from the police when it comes to investigating these cases. It's, it's, it's like um, something happening in the house and someone else in the house is going to investigate them about what happened. The truth will never come out. So we definitely have to uh, work really hard to strip the power away from the police officers when it comes to investigating cases uh, around police brutality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad you were, um, you were able to join. I um, want to uh, switch us back to uh, talk about call to, this call to action. I think what Carlos noted was that this is a long fight. It's been a long fight. We hear from Ashley that this goes back. There's an organ. There was a legal organization, just like Arch City, the ACLU, who um, was naming a call to action, you know, many years ago. And so we're here. Uh, and so how can we? What do we have as our vision? And what you see here is at a very high level the idea that you will have transparency, that there will be holistic, immediate support for families, and there will be some semblance of justice for victims and families. And while it's hard to define justice, our definition comes from the families in that justice looks like actually having uh, the information on your loved one's death, the access to legal support and community support uh, to change policies, to have some form of remuneration. These are the things we, we note. Um, and that's where we get our definition. This is Arch City's plan moving forward. We're going to work for holistic advocacy. So accessing information through Missouri's public records law. And if uh, agencies will not provide that information, doing whatever is necessary to get those records for families, including um, separately filing civil rights lawsuits on behalf of families, either our city itself or working with our partners, um, other private attorneys or other organizations to do that. So we will provide holistic legal advocacy um, this is something we've done and we're just going to uh, be pushing forward, putting resources behind it, which is one of the reasons that I'm at Arch City. Uh, other part as we think about media and policy advocacy is shifting the narrative. Uh, what we've heard from today is that families um, unfortunately experience really biased media. And so we're gonna support them with telling family stories. You'll see in our social media that we're capturing um, stories and we're telling those throughout this week. We'll continue to do that. Uh, we're also going to use data to drive policy change. So again, I'll point us to the policy report and our website, which actually has the data that we've captured. And finally, we will, uh, through community collaborations, work uh, to revamp uh, CAPCAR's crisis response program uh, to ensure that there is a community of support for families that meets on a regular basis and that we create a network of community-based resources. Uh, we know that there are uh, victim services units in prosecutor's office, in some contexts, police departments, but we know those are not for us. They're not for the families. So we're building that ourselves uh, in collaboration with Faith for Justice, Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression, and other organizations. So that's where we're coming from. We're very much at the early stages. Um, we don't have all the answers. Uh, this report represents our preliminary findings, uh, but as an organization that's committed to addressing state violence, the criminalization of poverty, and committed to racial justice, we see it as our duty to support the families however we can and to collaborate with others to realize a different future. Um, our hope is that you who's on this call that you will join us as we stand with families and support them. Um, on the screen, you have the ways to contact us uh, via email at stateviolence at archcitydefenders.org, at our website, archcitydefenders.org, backslash fatal state violence, or on social media. Uh, we hope that you will tweet about today's conversation using hashtag justice for them all or fatal state violence STL. 
Um, and again, we hope that you will join us and step up however it makes sense in your role, be it uh, as a member of the community, as uh, an activist, as a researcher, as a member of the media, how can we do a better job to support these families? So I'm going to turn then to uh, Q&A. And um, Inez, I'll open it up for you for reading any of the questions that we've come through. OK, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, we have three questions so far, the first of which is from Kathy. Um, she is asking, is there a connection between violence by the state and violence in general? Great, so I, I'll start with that question and anyone, uh, any of the other panelists. I think one of the things that is important to name is that violence is a reality as we see it, that there is interpersonal violence. And so this is violence that we see um, individuals, uh, family members, members of a community interact with each other. And so the way that's usually framed in our system is crime, criminal activity. Unfortunately, and I think um, John kind of pointed to this as part of that conversation, our response to deal with that type of violence is largely an, an arrest and incarcerate model. Um, and that model brings police into incidences where there are co there's conflict. Um, and rather than being able to prevent that conflict from happening or to actually de-escalate conflict as it's happening or to ensure that lives are protected, um, including the lives of individuals who might be part of that conflict or part of actually creating violence in the community, police generally meet violence with violence. And so that in ensures that you're going to have death, um, ensures that you're going to have what we call fatal state violence because you don't have a tool that is effective at dealing at instances where we do have what we know to be real. There is violence in the community, there's um, conflict, there's harm, uh, but the system that we have today, our arrest and incarcerate model, largely uh, fails to both prevent that violence from happening because it doesn't address root causes, um, things like poverty or different issues, mental health issues, things like that. But then also when it meets um, violence in the community that it's supposed to address, it can create harm. So then you do see instances of fatal state violence. Um, and that's why part of the work that we say around defund the police, uh, the defund the police campaign or cap cars uh, campaign to reimagine public safety is trying to identify alternatives that can deal with what we know to be true, real violence, real harm in our communities can we create alternatives that are available uh, that don't mean somebody with a gun is showing up every time? Um, John, I don't know if you would add anything to that or anyone else on the panel. Um, yeah, I would just add that the psychic damage that's done when we have a state that justifies killing. Um, you know, we've just had a whole series now of federal executions um, Missouri has proceeded with the death penalty um, in recent years. And, you know, I grew up with the saying, you don't kill people to show people that killing is wrong. Um, but that's what we do. Um, and the psychic effect of justification of violence by the state, I think, filters down into our culture at large and, um, and affects, you know, just the the nature of how we decide to settle disputes in our cult, in our culture. Um, secondly, I would say this, that, you know, there's a, a lot of talk in the media about the police needing to get bigger and bigger guns because there's bigger and bigger guns on the street. But I've often seen that work in the other direction where kids need to feel that they have to arm themselves because the police are out there um, actively working to, uh, to get them. And so uh, that cycle of violence, I think, builds on itself. Thank you, John. Yeah, and, um, I would, and I would just add, you know, to what you mentioned, Emmanuel, of like creating alternatives um, to just the sort of defund narrative is, is important, but, you know, making sure that those alternatives don't continue to perpetuate the violence, right? And making sure that those alternatives are not essentially rooted in white supremacy, I think is a really important piece. Um, to that to that story definitely for sure great 
The next okay, point. the next question is, what can community members do to help stop these wrongful killings by police? So I'll, I'll name that there's a lot of campaigns and work that's going on, and I'll probably turn it back to John if there's, you know, work that CAPCAR um, is focused on. I'll name for this particular project, we are oriented around supporting the families in the aftermath, and there will be a lot of opportunities for volunteering um, and otherwise support. Um, that is something if you go to our Arc City, to the Arc City website, you can uh, reach out to us, email us, and be able to, uh, you know, be able to identify ways to support um, our work. And that again is kind of forthcoming. Um, but I'll turn to John just to name again what are some of the campaigns that are already happening and ways folks can plug in. Um, yeah, just just briefly, you know, it was Kwame Ture who said, "Organize, organize, organize," and. Um, it always comes back to that. Um, but, you know, St. Louis has been organizing. Inez has been one of the leaders of the Coastal Workhouse campaign, and that is an ongoing struggle. So folks who want to get involved in that, who want to talk to their older persons or, you know, other civic leaders about how this arrest and incarcerate model has failed us and how the money, um, millions and millions of dollars that are being spent on the workhouse could be better spent in our communities. Um, so there's that campaign. Um, you're welcome to con contact CAPCAR. Um, our website is capcar-stl.org. Um, and, you know, plug into either our, our community education around reimagining public safety or our sp specific campaigns around the city budget, which will be coming to a head this spring um, around the defunding the police coalition. Um, so there's, I, those are some initial places to jump in, but there are a lot of affinity groups in different parts of the city who are working on individual cases. Some folks are just more comfortable being out on the street um, protesting, and that has a huge effect. Um, letters to the editor, there's just so many different places to jump in. Great. Um, and I'll name also that you know, one of the obvious ones and one part of the conversation we'll be a part of in the coming months is what are these alternatives? So for example, I think today, if you call 211, someone's having a mental health emergency, there's ways that uh, you can have someone who's not the police showing up to ensure that someone, you know, has someone who's not going to have a gun to deal with a mental health emergency. So there's uh, on an individual level, uh, different ways as we think about dealing with conflict um, or in certain contexts, can we create alternate uh, models to get support? So, uh, and that stuff will be, uh, Arch City and our partners like CAPCAR and others will be kind of exposing later. So I'll turn it back to Inez. This question is for John. Um, and the question is, in the reviews of circuit attorneys, IAB investigations of death by law enforcement, when they announce to the public whether or not to indict, do the CAs release to the public a decision letter listing its findings? Uh, Wade goes on to say, because um, they have found in other, other areas of the country where DAs release a decision letters, the one he's seen are so early in the investigation that they tend to be one-sided to law. Yet it would be what, I'm sorry, it would be what the DAs point to and basically step away from. Thus to me, making it seem as if these decision letters are a systemic item to defend against. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think that's a very astute observation and I don't think that our circuit attorney does put out any kind of decision letter like that. Um, one of the things that has been a dynamic here is that um, St. Louis elected um, a more progressive prosecutor um, you know, a little over four years ago um, and she has been pushing back against the police um, and the investigations that they do um, and she has actually refused to make any decisions in a whole multitude of cases because 
she doesn't have the capacity to investigate these uh, incidents herself and she's not willing to rely on the police investigation. And so what we've seen is a bottleneck um, of FIU reports coming from the police department and kind of running into a stopping point at the circuit attorney's office. She doesn't want to dismiss those cases or, find, or clear anybody, but she also doesn't have the capacity to investigate. And so um, I think there's a good opportunity here in St. Louis right now to kind of change the pattern that our questioner was pointing out, um, where the prosecutors do tend to just rely on an incomplete police investigation. Um, and so stay tuned to that campaign and a board bill that will try to shift that authority for investigations to the circuit attorney's office um, and uh, create a special unit, a public integrity unit with the capacity to do those investigations. Great, so I, I'll name that we are at time. And so uh, just to respect everyone's time, I think we'll probably take one more question um, and then we'll sign off for the day. Okay, um, we can type out the other questions. There are three total. Um, and so we can type those out while we're closing out. Um, I'm gonna take this next question from Angela. Living in a 24-7 news cycle, how do you counsel families who have had to combat a false narrative led in conjunction with the police and the media? What do you tell them? Marlene, uh, Tony, would either of you, uh, Gina, either of you like to weigh in on I'll that? I'll jump in on that one and, and because I think it's critical. Um, it, Two things. Number one, I would absolutely tell you that it's vital to have someone in your family that is designated as a spokesperson and make it known to your entire family that that person is the spokesperson and that anything else they hear or see in the media attributed to anyone is not from the family, that, that's one side of it. The other side of it I would tell you is that when you respond without support, um, someone like a Rebecca, who's very good at these things, you tend to encourage that news cycle to just continue. Um, I've told people over and over again, I don't care what the news said, it isn't true, and you just have to walk away. And the keyboard cowards who pound the internet um, with horrific um, replications of what they think happened, um, the um, words that I can't even repeat in this environment you have to be able to just walk away from it because your, your goal here is justice for your loved one and dealing with all of that peripheral stuff is just not important at this point. And I would also tell people the media is not your friend. And I say that because I know there's probably media people on here and I don't want them to think that I'm anti-media, but they're driven, sound bites drive ratings. And if we give them sound bites, they get ratings. And they can go back to the police and they can continue to just spiral this thing into something that just grows in capacity. So from my own personal perspective, I only talked to, we only talked to two uh, reporters in five years, almost five years. And those were both recommended um, by Rebecca from Arch City. We refused every other media attention and that can shut that piece down. Somebody else wanna jump in? Um, I would like to jump in. It's Tony Taylor. Um, what I have to say about the media 
is if you as a family jump out there and take control of the narrative first, the media can't change everything around from the truth. When I first lost Carrie, I got out there and I did an interview with Rebecca Revis from the St. Louis American. At the time of doing that interview, it's a YouTube video up that's it's called Families Questions Police Shooting. As we was doing that video with Rebecca, two police officers drove down the street. That they went through down, turned their sirens on, waved at me and smiled. They said, hi, mom. They didn't know I was down there with a real reporter and crew doing a story on my son. I got out there first and gave the narrative of what I felt happened just listening from the witnesses. And you are correct, Marlene. I always have a spokesperson, one or two people in your family to tell the story for you so it can't get switched around. When the family take lead of the narrative first before the media, they have a hard time trying to put that out there. And I'm with you again, Marlene. I don't talk to that many reporters either. One reporter that I trust the most is Rebecca Rebus from the St. Louis American. She has never did not one negative story on Kerry since I have lost him. St. Louis Post Dispatch did a story. It was kind of so so. It opened up a can of worms, I felt like, for the city of St. Louis to see that all of these murders are happening from the St. Louis Police Department. I don't speak to that many reporters either because they love to take, like you said, the little sound bite and switch it around. They will take your words and turn it around. I don't like that. I don't know what happens to those two officers during that time. They supposed to have been reprimanded for what they did to my family that day. I'm not even sure what happened to the other two officers that actually killed Kerry because four years later in 2017, one of the officers that's mentioned in my son's killing was also mentioned in Gina Torres shooting. And from day one, I tried to bring that to everybody's attention about how they are training these police officers to go around town and kill our loved ones because not only was that one officer at my son's shooting, he was as well as at Isaiah Hammond shooting, Mansur Ball Bay shooting. And I think we even found out later that he was at Kajimi Powell shooting. So to me, for them to get promoted, they're switching them around and training them to be killers out on our street. So I say, jump out there and take the narrative and control the narrative throughout your entire fight with your loved one. Were you about to say something, Gina? I apologize. Uh, no, I'm with uh, Marlene and Tony. You know, the media does like to change words around. The day that they uh, they murdered my son, um, I think it was Channel Two News. They always they changed my father's words around. They you know changed my words around and, the, and what's funny about it is they only want to put it up on the tv one time nobody's known about my son because they only put it on tv and on top of it when they did they put a ak-47 that they said my son shot the police that did not work and then otol said that they did a fantastic job killing my son so um yeah i'm with marlene and tony on that um I, you're scared to talk to them because they don't get the story straight. They all work with police too, kind of. There's been very few that actually tells our story the way we told it. Thank you. So I, um, again, recognizing we're over time, we'll close the Q&A, but want to name that you can reach us at stateviolence at archcitydefenders.org. You can go to our website, archcitydefenders.org slash fatal state violence. We're available on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, before we jump off, I just want to acknowledge the families who are here with us today and those um, that we've spoken to 
and the ones that we have not yet had an opportunity to connect with. I uh, want to thank you because it, what we've learned is that this always you can um, risk uh, going back into that trauma. And we know that families, as Gina mentioned, you can experience harassment when you speak out. Um, and we know that there's generally not anyone there to protect you from the police. Uh, so I just want to thank you for being here, for speaking with us, for working with us over these last few years. And I want to directly say, if you are a family that's watching this, or you are someone who knows a family that's watching this in St. Louis or Missouri, please email us, reach out to us. Um, if we can't help you on a legal standpoint, we want to uh, know your story, be able to share your story if you're interested and or provide access to the resources that we're developing. Um, I want to thank Deaconess for providing um, us this platform, for setting up the Zoom, uh, getting the information out there via Facebook. Uh, they are a, a committed partner to Arch City, so we thank you so much. Um, talking about partners, just want to raise up again the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression, Faith for Justice, who we will be working with to revamp uh, crisis response programs and creating spaces for families in the coming year. Um, and then just want to elevate uh, Carry on the Ball organization, which is an organization uh, created uh, by Tony and Carrie's family that we have um, would just like to name that there is work happening from families that, um, uh, that we have been part of learning from. And then finally, just want to take uh, space to thank all of the interns, staff, volunteers that help create uh, all of the content, uh, the policy report, the website, there's a video that was released earlier today in our social media. All of that is primarily coming um, from our staff here. Z Gorley, um, Simone Palmer, Daniil Garamasov, um, Emma Clar. There's a long list uh, that you will see in the report. I just wanna create space because um, this would not have happened again without all of that work. So we are at the end. I just want to name finally that uh, we will continue to work on this. We have been working on it. This is an initiative focused on taking this more strategically. Um, and so want to thank you for joining us on the holiday. We hope that you take that spirit uh, that we began with, MLK spirit that said, we will not stop fighting uh, for justice, for civil rights, until things like the unspeakable horrors of police brutality are no longer. We are standing up to fight for this and we hope that you'll join us, reach out to us. Um, we're excited to move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Have a good day. You too.